Good morning. I'm thrilled to be part of the Talented 12 class. Uh, thank you to CNE News uh, and to the tremendous amount of work I'm sure it has taken to put on the symposium. So I'm Marquita Landry. I'm an assistant professor of chemical and biomolecular engineering at UC Berkeley, uh, where I started my lab three years ago. And I thought I would start by introducing a little bit about myself. Uh, this is what I like to do when I'm not doing or thinking about science, although sometimes I do think about science while I'm hiking. Uh, but hiking in the outdoors is a big part of my life. Uh, I really enjoy being outdoors. I really enjoy climbing things. And here uh, on the far right are a few select pictures uh, of uh, myself and my family uh, hiking the W in the Torres del Paine National Park in Patagonia, uh, similarly climbing things in Iceland, uh, checking out my new home or near my new home, uh, Yosemite National Park. Uh, and this bottom one is at the top or near the top of Mount Fuji uh, after summiting in the dark. Uh, I also really enjoy dancing, salsa dancing and tango dancing in particular, hobbies that I picked up and carried out through graduate school. Uh, my hobbies weren't always out the outdoors. Uh, I used to be more of a contact sport person in high school. Uh, my sport of choice uh, was actually wrestling, uh, whereas I was on the wrestling team for a few years. Uh, my family is largely from a city called La Paz, uh, which is in Bolivia, and this is a city that is 13,000 feet above sea level. Uh, this is a photo of a younger me uh, hitching a ride with a cousin uh, near our home in La Paz, uh, and this is a more recent version uh, of, or a recent picture uh, of a trip that I took to visit family uh, in the meantime. And this is probably one of my favorite pictures of all because it's a picture that was taken one month after I started as a professor uh, at UC Berkeley. And it's of me hooding my very first uh, PhD student. Um, now, before students get too excited about joining a lab that turns out PhDs in one month, I would like to clarify uh, that this is my younger sister, Allie. Uh, she and I overlapped in the department. She is a PhD student, me as a professor, for about one month. Uh, and luckily, uh, her advisor, lucky for me, was out of town uh, when the hooding ceremony took place. So I was able to hood her uh, as she graduated uh, from our department. And I know that her advisor did most of the work, but I taught her how to walk. So I like to think that I had some play uh, in her success in graduate school. A little bit more about my professional background. Uh, so as I alluded to, my family is Bolivian from uh, this uh, landlocked country in South America depicted here, but I'm half French Canadian. Uh, my dad's family is from Quebec and I grew up in Ottawa uh, and moved to the United States in, uh, as a high school student uh, where I completed part of my high school in North Carolina. I then went on to get a, a degree in chemistry and a degree in physics from UNC Chapel Hill, uh, went on to do a PhD in chemical physics at Illinois, and then switched gears uh, when I did a postdoc at MIT uh, to explore nanotechnology. Uh, and my group today combines flavors of all of these past training experiences uh, into the work that we do today, and my group is also depicted here. Now, my PhD was done in a field known as optical trapping. Uh, this is a field uh, that was awarded the Nobel Prize last year. And essentially, it leverages the fact that you can take light, focus it down to a diffraction-limited spot, and trap dielectric particles to manipulate matter on a single molecule scale. And specifically, during my thesis, I was looking at polymer elasticity on a piconewton scale. As a postdoc, I was really excited to take the tools that I'd learned to develop as a PhD student and apply them to a new field, specifically nanotechnology, for characterization of nanomaterials, specifically optically active nanomaterials, in a way that biophysics uh, had done really well. And when I started my lab at UC Berkeley, this is what I envisioned. I envisioned setting up these precise instruments, these optical tools, and being able to take very precise measurements in a very pristine and clean environment. Uh, but my lab looks a little bit more like this. And so similar to some of the career paths that we heard about earlier today, uh, a lot of my research interests have diverged, uh, less so in understanding fundamental biophysical, biochemical interactions, and rather leveraging those interactions to build tools to either learn more or to manipulate genetically biological systems. And so I'll tell you a little bit about these two flavors of my lab's research, again, keeping in mind that many of the focus areas of our lab really depend on understanding and being able to tune this physiochemical properties that nanomaterials can have. 
So the first story I'll tell you is one of how we use uh, nanomaterials to genetically manipulate plants. Now, the, the genetic manipulation of plants uh, is really a key factor in many different technologies, the first of which is agriculture, uh, in which the genetic manipulation of plants can confer desirable traits to crops, such as pest resistance uh, or resistance to climate change. Pharmaceuticals is another area in which genetic engineering of plants and plant matters is important because many drugs and natural products originate from plants, and also in the bioenergy sector where biofuels and biomass can be increased through its uh, genetic manipulation. Now, all of these applications depend on getting the workhorses of genetic manipulation from outside plant cells into plant cells, specifically DNA, RNA, and protein. Now, the tools that are currently used to deliver these biomolecules into plants are two. The first is agrobacterium-mediated delivery. So agrobacterium leverages this natural evolution of a pathogen, agrobacterium, to replace the DNA of interest, of our interest, into the agrobacterium so that it can in turn deliver this DNA into the plant cell. Now, because this is a naturally evolved mechanism, the species of plants that can be transformed with, the te with this technology are relatively limited. Biolistic part particle delivery is the other option, and here uh, what happens is we can take gold or tungsten particles, dehydrate DNA, RNA, or protein onto them, and then quite literally shoot them into plant cells. This causes the cell to incorporate the genetic material, and in both cases, either the use of a pathogen or the integration of exogenous genetic material into the host genome triggers regulation of the plant product as a genetically modified organism, or a GMO. And so, as you may be aware, slapping this non-GMO label on a bag of oranges or apples uh, can significantly increase uh, both the price point of the product and consumer acceptance of that crop. Despite the challenges in genetic engineering of plants, both societal and also in terms of time and money, there has been quite a bit of success in generating GM crops. And the United States is a global leader in the production of GM crops uh, shown here. Most of these are used either for feed uh, or for uh, non-consumer-based products, uh, but there are several crops on the market that are GM that are intended for human consumption, and I think one of the uh, examples I like to give uh, is the generation of golden rice. This is a varietal of rice that has had the gene for vitamin A expression engineered into it such that it glows golden, and the concept here is that this varietal of rice could help deliver vitamin A to vitamin A deficient uh, populations. Now, despite, again, the success of these crops, it takes a long time to genetically engineer a plant. Uh, a genetically engineered plant or crop in the United States takes on average 13 years of R&D at a cost of $136 million. And about 40 million of these $136 million are just regulatory. So there's a significant time and cost consideration to be had for the creation of GM crops. And this is attributed largely to inefficient tools, and to the GM regulatory burden. So we sought to create a tool that would be plant species independent, efficient, and also for GM considerations, non-pathogenic and non-integrating. So we'd have better control over where that genetic material occurs uh, in the plant. When considering the design of such tools, nanotechnology comes into mind, because if we think about the size exclusion limits that we need to traverse for biomolecule delivery, the plant cell membrane, which is the membrane uh, that all cells have has a size exclusion limit of about 500 nanometers. So for most delivery applications in biology, usually the size exclusion limit is enough. So 500 nanometers being about as large as something can be before it can no longer traverse the membrane. But the plants, in addition to having a cell membrane, also have a cell wall. And what this means is that this new barrier with a size exclusion limit of as small as five nanometers presents the dominant barrier to molecular delivery. So this means we have to be clever in the tools that we choose for delivery applications. And this becomes a bit of a Goldilocks problem, right? Because we want to stay as small as possible, but we also want to have enough surface area for doing chemistry and for biomolecule grafting. So something like a buckyball would be small enough, but not high enough of a surface area. Conversely, with a 2D graphene sheet, a lot of surface area not small enough, and a one-dimensional material provides a nice in-between, where the smallest dimension is still small enough but now there's a surface area on which we can do chemistry. 
So the concept being that we can put our biomolecule of choice onto these carbon nanotubes or these high aspect ratio materials. They would go through the plant, cell wall and membrane, and allow transcription and translation of a transgenic protein. And so the workflow looks something like this. We can load these materials on with DNA plasmids. Uh, we can cause the expression of a green fluorescent protein, which is a nice scorable marker that we can use. And then we can do microscopy to assess whether or not this genetic protein or this transgenic protein has been expressed in the tissue. So our results look something like this. For a variety of species of plants, we observe expression of this transgenic green fluorescent protein in the tissue. And one of the interesting features of this platform is that if we look 10 days later at where the expression was, we see that the fluorescence protein expression goes back down to baseline. What this suggests is that the transgenic DNA is not being integrated into the host genome. And we can validate this also with something known as a quantitative PCR uh, to confirm on a molecular level that this is in fact the case. So what this is exciting, uh, or the reason that this is exciting, is because we can now express a transgenic protein transiently without DNA integration. What this means is that instead of making plants go, uh, glow green for day, uh, by day three, we can instead express a protein known as a nuclease, or Cas9, that when complexed with a synthetic guide RNA, can target regions of the plant genome for modification. And if the plasmid transiently expresses these proteins, we can get a permanent edit in the host genome without transgenic labeling of the plant product. And so the advantages of doing so in a variety of different crop uh, species and different tissue types would be to combine the precision of nuclease technology with the avoidance of GM, GM labeling in the absence of using a pathogen and the absence, in the absence of transgene integration as well. So the last little bit that I'll tell you about today uh, involves a slightly different flavor, uh, which focuses on neurochemistry. Now, there are many different reasons that we would want to study the brain, and these reasons uh, lie in the core that neuromodulation, or the transmission of chemical signals between neurons, is really at the core of both health and disease uh, in brain and behavior research. Now, while there are many tools to study the structure of the brain or the uh, action potentials, uh, the logicated signals that cause the release of these neurotransmitters, there are very few tools to study the actual chemical activity. And this is because it would be like taking uh, a large analytical device and trying to miniaturize it to the place where it's important to capture these events. Now these neuromodulators, norepinephrine, dopamine, and serotonin, again, are classically the targets uh, of many drugs uh, for antidepressants and antipsychotics. So the way we address this problem is by creating a molecular recognition that is synthetic and that is specific to the neurotransmitters of choice. So we can create a library of these synthetic polymers that when absorbed to the surface of these carbon nanotubes will perturb the surface of the carbon nanotube creating an optical or a fluorescent signal that is specific to that analyte. Now, because this platform is generic, we can do this for any polymer analyte combination, uh, but the goal here is to create a construct that optically responds in the presence of only our uh, neurotransmitter target. And so once we've determined which conjugates or which nanosensors are selective for our, our neurotransmitters of choice, we can validate them in brain tissue. And by doing so, we can create these acute slices of brain tissue, embed our sensors into these slices, and then image them. So what you're seeing here is an infrared movie capturing the fluorescence of these nanosensors upon stimulation of the tissue and capturing of dopamine release in the striatum, which is a very dopamine-heavy part of the brain. Now, this is important because the synthetic molecular recognition elements provided by these carbon constructs allow us to assess the effects of drugs, of pharmacology that targets dopaminergic neurotransmission. And we can look at dopamine agonists and antagonists and their effects on the concentrations of dopamine in the extracellular space of the brain as it's being shuttled between cells, and also the residence time of these neurochemicals in the ECS. So for example, if we look at drug Quinprol, uh, which is a psychoactive drug, we would see the predicted effect with bath application of Quinprol. Here we see dopamine release and reuptake in artificial cerebral spinal fluid, and then after we add the drug. And then we can do the same thing with sulpuride, where we can see instead an increase in dopamine release in the extracellular space of the brain. 
But one of the interesting features of this technology is because we're not averaging over hundreds of terminals, because we're not using these large analytical devices to average over our signals, we can ask, what is each of these dopamine release hotspots doing? And we can start assess or assessing what each of these hotspots is doing relative to the effects of the drug, where again, the predicted effect here would be for the drug to diminish dopamine release. And that's exactly what we see most of the hotspots doing, where anything below this DF over F ratio of one suggests the predicted drug response. But as you can see, there are a significant number of hotspots that actually have the opposite response. And so using technologies such as these, we're hoping to better understand and better assess what some of the endogenous variabilities are in how neurons respond to these dopamine receptor agonists and antagonists uh, that are really the core of our pharmaceuticals uh, in brain and behavior science. So with that, I would like to greatly thank my lab and the uh, large series of mentors that I've had along the way. Specifically, the work that was shown here was done by a very talented graduate student, Gus de Demmer, uh, and supported uh, by Frankie Cunningham and Juan Zhang, who are presenting at the conference here today. Um, and uh, the support also from the USDA and the Innovative Genomics Institute for the work that I've shown here. And I'm glad to take any questions uh, if we have time. <laughs>